Well, it's so good to see each of you, and I want to thank you for your faithfulness in coming. You know, something that we failed to mention that I thought I just should share with you right now, each of these programs is also being presented with signing by a dear friend of ours, Noah Lani, and the programs, fortunately, are all archived on the Washington SDA conference site. It's the American Deaf... It's the, the Washington Conference um, Deaf Ministries. The, the Deaf Ministries for the Washington Conference. You can find that online. So if you've missed any programs, you can share that with your friends that would appreciate the signing as well. Tonight's presentation, dealing with a double portion of God's Spirit, it comes to us from the second book of Kings. You might want to go there. Second book of Kings, chapter 2. Second Kings, chapter 2. And while you're finding that, I want to repeat something I shared with you last night because it figures in to our presentation this evening as well. Last words in the Old Testament. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Remember the law of Moses. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet. Now, Elijah the prophet figures very prominently in the New Testament in a number of ways. One, we studied last night how both Moses and Elijah appeared to, the, um, to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. In addition to that, you can read in the Bible where Jesus said that John the Baptist would be doing a ministry that was similar to that of Elijah. In fact, when the angel first came to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, and he says here in Luke chapter 1, verse 15, prophesying about this child that was given to Zechariah and Elizabeth in their old age, he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. How'd that happen? Through the preaching. He'll turn them to the Lord their God. He will go before him. The him is H-I-M, the Messiah. In the spirit and power of Elijah. Now it's interesting that when the religious leaders came to John the Baptist, they said, are you Elijah? He said, no. But later Jesus says that John the Baptist is the one who came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Why did John say no? Because the religious leaders were not asking, are you coming in the spirit and power of Elijah? They were asking, are you Elijah resurrected? And God doesn't teach reincarnation. And they were wanting to know, are you a reincarnation of Elijah? He said, no, I'm a different person, but I've got the same Holy Spirit power that Elijah had. You see what the difference is? And then Jesus said another time, he said, I say unto you that Elijah has come. This is after John the Baptist had been executed by Herod. He said, Elijah has come and Elijah will come. You notice that Jesus uh, tells us there in Malachi, the word of God says, before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That's the day of the Lord, the great judgment day. That's future. In the last days, the spirit and power of Elijah is going to come again. The first time it comes is what you would call the former rain. The last time it comes in what you might call the latter rain. Now you will hear these words in the Bible, former rain, latter rain. What does that mean? When I first read the Bible, I was wondering, in the Hebrew farming economy, they would pray for what they called the early or former rains that when they first planted their seed, they did not have, you know, uh, electric pumps and sprinkler irrigation. They prayed for the rain. And so what would happen is they plant all their seed, they'd pray for what they call the early rain that would sprout the crops and get it growing. Then before harvest, they would pray for a good latter rain that would help ripen and make the, the crops and the grain very lush and plump and full. And so Jesus sent the Holy Spirit at Pentecost for the apostles to sprout the seed that he had spread during his three and a half years of ministry, ministry, Jesus said, the word of God is like the seed. And so when the Holy Spirit fell, the former rain, in the days of the apostles, Acts chapter 2, that sprouted the gospel and it began to spread all through the civilized world. Before Jesus comes again, there is going to be a latter rain outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And boy, the church needs it badly. 
And I think God is going to have some that will come in the spirit and power of Elijah. Have you ever read about the 144,000? Well, I better be careful because I can launch into a revelation study right now. But so, with that lengthy background, I want you to go now to the passage I gave you there in 2 Kings chapter 2. And this is the story where God is going to take Elijah to heaven in a fiery chariot. God told him in advance he was going to do this. Elijah was one of the greatest Old Testament prophets. Probably his pinnacle moment for Elijah was when all the other prophets are hiding in caves. Elijah goes boldly to King Ahab. Ahab had been searching all over the world for Elijah to find him because Elijah had told Ahab, it is not going to rain, not a drop, until my word. Three and a half years had gone by, no rain, famine, death. The country was devastated by the famine. They knew it was because of Elijah, the prophecy, the prophecy that Elijah had given. Ahab and Jezebel are looking everywhere. The false prophets of Baal had filled the land, and this was a judgment on the idolatry and Baal worship. Finally, Elijah's got the boldness to go right up to Ahab when Ahab's out riding by himself and say, gather all of Israel to me on Mount Carmel because God's going to do something. And the king obeys Elijah. And Elijah says, you're the one who's troubling Israel. Ahab said to Elijah, you're troubling Israel. Elijah says, no, you and your wife's harlotries are troubling Israel, meaning the idolatry bold, brave prophet, kind of like when John the Baptist told Herod, you shouldn't be married to your brother's wife. You don't say that to kings. You can lose your head, which is what happened. So Elijah's this great prophet, and they're up on Mount Carmel. He tells the prophets of Baal, you build your altar, I'll build my altar. We'll ask God to answer by fire. Whichever God answers by fire, he'll be the real God. By the way, Elijah's name means my God is Jehovah. And so um, prophets of Baal go through all of their dancing and hooting and hollering. Half a day, nothing happens. And they keep repeating over and over, Oh, Baal, hear us. Oh, Baal, hear us. Nothing happens. And Elijah stood fearlessly against 400 prophets of Baal and 850 prophets of the groves, uh, 450 prophets of the groves. So it's like 850 prophets against one. So when Jesus said in the last days, Beware of false prophets, he says there'll be many false prophets. False prophets usually outnumber true prophets, but there are still true prophets. Amen. He didn't say beware of any prophets. He said watch out for the false ones. And then Elijah prays. Simple prayer takes 30 seconds to repeat the prayer of Elijah. From a cloudless sky, fire rains down, burns up the altar, leaves a big crater smoldering there. And the whole nation turns back to God. And they say, the Lord, he is God. They actually say, the Lord, he is Jehovah. The Lord, he is Jehovah, which is Elijah, Elijah. It's his name. In the great revival, he slays all the prophets of Baal. Then he prays and rain comes down. And because he stood up for God in this unique way when everyone else went underground, God said, I'm not going to let you die the death of other men. I'm going to take you to heaven in my own private limousine chariots and horsemen of fire. So he had revealed this to Elijah. Now he didn't know exactly when it was going to happen. But before he ascends to heaven, Elijah wants to go around and encourage the different schools of the prophets that they have in the northern kingdom. By the way, before Jesus ascended to heaven, after his resurrection, Jesus went and met with the apostles on several different occasions and opened the word to encourage them. Similar you'll find that he is like a type of Christ in this story. Verse 1, And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Now I've got to explain. Who is Elisha? This is a tough message to share because their two names are very similar and it can sound like a tongue twister. Hopefully I won't mess up, but I usually do. Elisha was a young apprentice. He was the son of some wealthy farmers. And um, 
God had told Elijah, before you ascend to heaven, I want you to pick someone and train and disciple this person. And who knows, it may have been three and a half years, just like Jesus with the apostles. But there was a period of time, probably a few years, that Elijah had Elisha follow him everywhere as his servant to observe how he worked, how he lived, how he taught, and to learn from him. And when he was first called, Elijah was passing through the country where Elisha lived. He saw Elisha out plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. Now, if you're, that means Elisha and the servants have 12 yoke of oxen. In Bible times, if you had a yoke of oxen, you were wealthy. Most people did it by hand or with a donkey. That's kind of like a Texas farmer that's got 12 tractors. So he's coming from a wealthy family. And Elijah passes by and he casts his mantle on the shoulders of Elisha. Elisha knew that meant, I am calling you to follow me, to be my apprentice, to train for me, to be my replacement. And he was willing to walk away from everything. Something like when Jesus said to Peter, James, John, and Andrew, follow me. And they forsook their nets and followed him. And Jesus says to Matthew, follow me. He walks away from his cash register and he follows Jesus. And Elisha simply said, let me say goodbye to my mother and my father. And then to prove he was not going to turn back after he'd been called by God, he sacrificed the oxen he had been plowing with. That's very expensive. He used the plow instruments as the wood to burn it. And he said, I, I, it's kind of like when Cortez burned the ship so the people would not leave. He was eliminating the way of escape. He said, I am committing to follow. You heard where Jesus said, any man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not worthy of the kingdom. He's referring to Elisha, where Elisha said, I'm going to follow Elijah and I am not going to look back. But he walked away from an inheritance in his family. Christ said, no man has given up father, mother, sister, brother, houses, lands for my sake in the gospel. But he'll receive a hundred times more in this life and eternal life in the world to come. But some who are invited to call to follow the Lord are called to walk away, sometimes from friends and family, and tremendous sacrifice. And so Elisha is willing to forsake everything to follow Elijah. And he doesn't want to look back. Now, it's interesting, don't miss what happens when Elijah first calls Elisha. It says that he puts his mantle, his robe on his shoulders. Don't forget that. That's coming up later in the story. The mantle of Elijah appears several times in the story. Who did I say Elijah represents? He's a type of Christ. You know, the most important article of clothing that Jesus had was his robe. It's the only thing they gambled for there at the cross, right? They didn't want to, the other things they just parted out, but they didn't want to tear his robe. And the robe of Christ is a symbol of the righteousness that covers our sin. And he will offer the redeemed new white robes, it says in Revelation. That is, it represents the righteousness of the saints. So he, he accepts this call and he begins to follow. Elijah means my God is Jehovah. Elisha means Elohim is Savior. Very similar to the name of Jesus as well. So you read on in the story here. And it tells us that before Elijah goes to heaven, he knows it's going to happen. Verse 2 of 2 Kings chapter 2. He says to Elisha, stay here please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. And Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel together. See what's happening is Elijah saying, you know, I, I'm going to wear you out, but before I ascend to heaven, I need to go and visit and encourage and talk to the sons of the prophets that are at these various schools that are scattered around the land. The southern kingdom, they had the Levites and the priesthood. The northern kingdom had rejected the Levites and so they had these sons of the prophets who did the spiritual work up there in that country. And they could be from any tribe. It's kind of like today. You know, you've got the Israelites and you've got Gentiles who are called to ministry from all different backgrounds. 
And so he says, I'm going to go with you wherever you go. Now, as we proceed, you're going to see that Elijah says, I'm going from Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho to Jordan and then across Jordan. That's where we're going to go. Each one of those names means something. Wherever Elijah goes, Elisha says, I am going to follow you. Now, let me tell you what I want you to learn from the story. I hope I don't spoil it for you, but before we're done, Elisha gets a double portion of the Holy Spirit of Elijah. If we look at what Elisha does, we can model that and hopefully we can get a double portion of God's Spirit. You know, you might be thinking, Pastor Doug, that's a pretty outrageous thing for you to say. But you know, Jesus said, these things that I have done, greater things than these will you do because I go to the Father. Why did Jesus say he was going to the Father? He told the disciples, it's expedient that I go that the Holy Spirit, the Comforter may come. And he said, greater things than these will you do. Most importantly, greater in extent because Jesus' ministry was restricted to the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel or the house of Israel, whereas the apostles went into all the world preaching the gospel. So it says that um, he went from Gilgal. The word Gilgal means circle. When the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River, the first place they bivouacked was Gilgal and they renewed the covenant with God there. Uh, the men who had not been circumcised during the wilderness wandering were circumcised there, renewing the covenant that God had given to Abraham. And the word means circle. And the way, the reason they say that is because it meant rolling away the reproach. It's a place of reconsecration. So when we first begin to follow, we consecrate ourselves. Some of you have drifted. You re-consecrate yourself to the Lord. And then he says we're going down to Bethel. Do you know what the word Bethel means? How many of you have seen churches that are Bethel this and Bethel that? Bethel means Beth is house, El is God. Whenever you see E-L in the Bible, it means God. Daniel, God is judge. Michael, who is like God. And you've got uh, uh, lots of L's in the Bible, you'll see. Elijah, Elijah, Shah, so forth. Beth, Jesus is born in Bethlehem, house of bread. Beth means house. Bethel, house of God. So one of the first steps, if you would like to be filled with the Holy Spirit, is be willing to follow Elijah to the house of God. I know it sounds really simple, friends, but it's amazing to me that I meet people that expect to go to heaven and they don't have enough faith to get them to church once a week and somehow they think they've got enough that's going to get them to heaven. If we can't come with Christ, you know, Jesus says when people are gathered together in his name, he's there. And when we gather on God's day with the Lord, we should be planning on being in that meeting because the Lord is present among his people at those occasions. And so... Um, he says, I'll follow you to Bethel. And he, he promises with a vow. Or, the Lord do so to me and more also. He says, I'm going to go with you. So they go on to Bethel together. And he encourages the sons of the prophets there. Now you go to verse 3. The sons of the prophets who are at Bethel, they come out to Elisha and they said, do you know, have you heard? The Lord is going to take away your master from over you today. Now they thought that he'd be excited about that. You won't be number two. You'll be number one prophet. You won't have to serve him anymore. There is a scripture where Elisha is described as the one who poured water on the hands of Elijah. Being the servant of Elijah was not a very luxurious position. If you've read the story of Elijah, he like lives by a brook and is fed by birds. He lives out in the desert under a bush and he's fed by an angel. He lives in the attic of a widow and he's miraculously fed. Wherever Elijah go, he's fed. Isn't that good to know? But they're not luxurious places. He's in caves and under bushes and in attics and by a creek. And then he says, I'm taking applications to be my servant. <laughs> and you say, well, what are the housing conditions? No promises. So, he was willing to serve. What's one of the most important criteria to being filled with the Holy Spirit? Jesus said, he is not greatest among you who has served. He is greatest among you who serves. Amen. Christ said, I have come to you as one that serves. In the world, we think that 
God's gifts are on shelves one above another. But if you're a Christian, you find out God's gifts are on the shelves one below another. And you get the best gifts by kneeling down. In the world, we think success is measured by how many serve you. But not with Christ. It's how many do you serve. That's how you determine the greatness with God. And Elisha says, don't even tell me about his leaving. I am sad. I am happy to serve him. It is my greatest joy to serve him. That should be the attitude of a Christian with God. It's not drudgery to serve Jesus. It is the highest privilege to serve Jesus. But it can sometimes be a humble station. People want to do great things for God and they forget that sometimes the greatest thing you can do for God might be a very humble thing. And we should do those things faithfully. I'm following you to Bethel. He said, I will not leave you. Sons of the prophet said, have you heard? He's leaving. And you know what he says to him? I know. Hold your peace. Keep silent. I don't want to hear about it. Then Elijah, verse 4, says to Elisha, stay here please, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. The word Jericho means fragrant. Sometimes God leads us in fragrant places. Sometimes there's blessings. And he says, wherever you go, that's where I'm going. And he promises with a vow once again. And as it happened before, the sons of the prophets, they had gotten the word and, and heard that Elijah was going to be taken up. And they come out and they say to Elisha, have you heard that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? He answered and said, yes, I know. Hold your peace. Keep silent. You know, three times this happens. Three times Jesus said to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And every time he said, I love you, he basically said, then be my prophet. Feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. That's what that means. And now Elijah says to Elisha, stay here please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. You know, this reminds me very much of that great verse you find in Ruth chapter 1, I think it's verse 16, where Naomi is going back to Bethlehem. Her husband and sons have died in Moab. Her daughter-in-laws are following her. One of her daughter-in-laws that has lost a son is Ruth. The other one is Orpah. I always wanted to call her Oprah. <laughs> it's, it's, I have messed it up before. Anyway, and so Orpah says, when, when Naomi says, go back, don't follow me, stay here. Just like, you know, Elijah said to Elisha, she waves goodbye and she goes back. And then she says, Ruth, what are you doing? Go home. She says, you know, there's going to be hardship in Bethlehem. I've lost everything. Why would you go with me? And she made that beautiful statement where she said, do not bid me to turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. The Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death separates you and me. What a wonderful declaration of commitment. And by the way, if you are a Christian, that's what we say to Jesus. Amen. Where you go, I go. Your people are my people. As mixed up as some of them might be. Your people are my people now. That's right. Where you lodge, there will I lodge. And there will I die. And so we're basically saying we're going to follow the Lord all the way even to death. Sometimes I'm asked to do weddings. I'm always very reluctant. Weddings make me more nervous than this. So there's a lot of protocol and stand here, do this, don't do that. And I get really nervous at weddings. I fainted two or three times <laughs> at weddings. Not really. I have seen people faint though. <laughs> but I think sometimes girls don't ask me to do their weddings because they don't want me to sign bachelor on their wedding certificate. <laughs> so, but this, it's a great, I always read about Ruth when I do a wedding, that statement. It's beautiful to include in a wedding vow. And this is what Elisha says to Elijah. I am going where you go. I will not leave you. Would God that every Christian had that determination and resolve when we take up our cross to follow Jesus. Amen. Say, Lord, by your grace, I will follow you wherever you go. And again, the sons of the prophets come out and say, have you heard the word? And he says, yes, I know. So I told you that he then leads him down to Jordan. And uh, the word Jordan now represents 
descending. I told you Jordan is the lowest place on earth. Jordan represents death. It represents baptism, but what is baptism? It's a symbol of death, burial, and resurrection. Paul makes it very clear. You're dead to the old ways. You inhale that new air when you come up. It's like a new birth. All the sins are washed away, and it represents a new beginning. And he says, I'm going to follow you wherever you go, even to Jordan. And so it comes to pass that as they go down to the Jordan, and we need to be willing to follow Jesus even in those uh, descending places. You know, don't be surprised. All that live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And 50 men of the sons of the prophets, I'm in verse 7, they went and they stood facing them at a distance. And while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now the Jordan's flooding. It's spring. And there's no way across unless you've got a boat and a rope. And Elijah takes his mantle. That's the robe that he put once on the shoulders of Elisha. And he rolls it up and he struck the water. I don't know if any of you ever, maybe the men more than the, the ladies, have taken a towel and made what they call a rat tail where you roll it up kind of at an angle and you can kind of make a whip out of a towel. And it's a good way to get your boys to obey. <laughs> you know. I used to go to military school. We'd have rat tail fights. And I got pretty good. I could take a fly off the wall with a towel. I really can. <laughs> but I, I, I always think this is a very dramatic moment because it says he struck the water. I think he rolled up his mantle and he went pop like that. And when he does that, a miracle happens. It says that he struck the water and it was divided this way and that way, meaning upstream and downstream. So the two of them crossed over on dry ground. So you got more than one miracle. Not only is the water being parted, the riverbed is being dried. Nature has stopped its natural course so they could go over. And why dry ground? If you went slogging through the mud, you'd come up dirty. But something happens with that mantle that makes it possible for them to cross over and come up clean. Who does Elijah represent? Jesus. That robe, Christ's righteousness. Jordan, death. What makes it possible for us to get on the other side and come up clean? It's not your righteousness. All of our righteousness is like filthy rags. It's the righteousness of Christ. It's the blood of Christ. Amen. The thing that made it possible for them to cross was that robe. You know, it tells us when they crucified Jesus that they took his robe off of him. You read it. And the soldiers mocked him. They put a purple robe on him and they beat him. On his back, he had been whipped by a scourge by Pilate. Beat him around the head with a crown of thorns. Then they took back the purple robe and they put his robe back on his scarred back. That robe was a blood-stained robe. How did Joseph's brothers hide what they had done to Joseph. They took Joseph's robe of many colors. They killed the lamb. They put blood on it. They showed it to their father to hide their sin of selling their brother hidden by a blood-stained robe. And it's the blood-stained robe that covers our sins. Yeah. Now, God gives it to us when we first come to Jesus. It doesn't matter what your past and your sins have been. Uh, people who think I've got to straighten out my life before I come to Jesus, they never come to Jesus because you'll never get it straightened out. You have to come to Jesus poor and sinful. It's like that famous hymn, just as I am without one plea, except thy blood was shed for me. You come to Jesus just like you are. And you might be thinking, I don't know how I'm going to live holy tomorrow. You don't worry about that. You first come to Jesus and he says, I am going to receive you. I'm going to justify you through my righteousness. The Father will see that blood-stained robe and your sins are forgiven. They're covered. Then after you receive the righteousness of Christ, a miracle happens in your life. He gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit that then gives you power to begin living differently. People keep waiting and say, if I could just change this and change that and then not be afraid about the temptation and falling, then I'll come to Jesus. You come to Him weak. You come to him helpless. He covers you with his robe of righteousness. Then he gives you power in his spirit to live a new life. Amen. That's why it said there in uh, Acts chapter 2, Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you 
for the remission of sins and you shall receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. God promises to give us power to live that new life. And you need it. What happened to Jesus after his baptism? He was tempted. But God had given him the anointing of the Spirit. So back to our story. He comes and he strikes the water. The water parts. The two of them cross over on dry ground. Verse 9, this is where it's really neat. And it was so that when they had crossed over, that Elijah says to Elisha, ask what I might do for you before I am taken away from you. Carte blanche. What would you ask for? You're given a, a blank check from Elijah. This is the prophet who prays, fire comes down from heaven. Matter of fact, three times Elijah prays and fire comes down. He prays, rain comes down. Birds bring him special delivery food. Angels feed him. God brings a, a hurricane and a forest fire and an earthquake to speak to Elijah there in the wilderness. I mean, this is a powerful prophet. And he says, anything I can do for you before I leave? What would you ask for? When God spoke to Solomon at night, the Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 3, Solomon loved the Lord, walking in all the commandments of the Lord. He made this great sacrifice to the Lord, and God appeared to him in a dream by night, said, ask what I might do for you. When God says ask, you think, ooh, ha, what shall I ask for? <laughs> well, you probably already know. What are your prayers filled with? Uh, your prayers filled with? I need more money for the mortgage, Lord, and if I could have this and if I could have that. And sometimes we ask for the wrong things. It's kind of like that man that was in prison and he was praying. And he said, Lord, please, if you could just get me a blanket in this prison, it is so cold. And Lord, while you're at it, if I could have a pillow for my head. And Lord, if they would just put a little heat in this building because I'm freezing. And Lord, the cell is so dark, could I get a brighter light? And Lord, my feet are so cold on the floor, if they'd have a little carpet. And he gives God his list and the Holy Spirit speaks to him and says, when are you going to ask me to get you out of prison? <laughs> That's how most of our prayers are saying, Lord, help me be more comfortable on my way to the electric chair. <laughs> and God is saying, why don't you ask me to get you off, to get you out to set you free. But we always ask God, make me comfortable while I live my life and go to destruction. Ask what I might do for you. You know, Jesus said that. He said, up until now, you've asked nothing. Ask that your joy might be full. You know, I, I kind of had a, uh, a wasted childhood. I was not raised a Christian and I watched all the goofy programs on TV and and I remember some of those stories from Arabian Nights about people that find genies. And, you know, it's always fun to fantasize if you found a genie and, and he popped out and said, what do you want? Three wishes. And invariably, what should the first wish be? Wish. Unlimited wishes, right? Or more genies or something like that. And you read the different stories and people always, there's this strange, the interesting ways that they squander their wishes. I remember one story where uh, three guys were washed up on some deserted island in the South Pacific and there's nothing there but some sand and a bunch of coconut trees. And they're stranded there for months just eating coconuts and drinking coconut milk and scrounging on the beach for a few pieces of shellfish and, and they're so bored. Finally one day, they're looking, oh, kept scanning the horizon for a ship or something and, and they look and one day they see on the waves something is floating towards them and they all get up and they get a little closer and they start walking out in the water just as it washes ashore and they all grab it at the same time and it's a bottle and wouldn't you know a genie pops out. It's a true story. <laughs> you got to watch those evangelists, right? <laughs> genie pops out and he looks around and he says, uh, wow, usually I give out three wishes but it seems like there's three of you here so what do you say? One wish each. And they all go, fair enough. First one doesn't hesitate. He says, I am so tired of this hot sweltering island. I've just been dreaming of being in Aspen, Colorado in the winter snow skiing. I want to be cool. And then poof, he disappears. The second one sees it must work. He says, I know what I want. 
says, I've been eating coconut, 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 breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I am so tired of coconut. I want to be in a smorgasbord in New York City and be able to eat as much as I want. Poof, he disappears. And as fate would have it, the third one's never the brightest. <laughs> and Jeannie says, what do you want? He goes, ooh, one wish? Jeannie says, one wish. Oh, I don't know how to decide. I wish my friends were here. <laughs> <laughs> Poof. They're all back. <laughs> One more real quick. Guy finds a genie, three wishes. First wish, Swiss bank account with a billion dollars. Poof, he's got his bank account. Second wish, I want the fastest red Maserati there is. Poof, got a red sports car. Third wish, says, I want to be irresistible to women. Poof, turns into a box of chocolates. <laughs> so, <laughs> only laughing because there's truth in there somewhere. So, getting more serious, Elijah says, ask what I might do for you. What is the most important thing that you could ask for? Listen to what he says. Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Now, I've just finished telling you Elijah is the greatest prophet in the Old Testament. Elisha is now saying, I want a double portion of your spirit. He knew he had the work of God to do and he wanted the spirit of God. You know, what he asked for is what Solomon asked for. God said, what do you want? Solomon said, that I might have a wise and an understanding heart that I might know the difference to discern between good and evil. Who can judge this great people of yours, Lord? What Solomon's asking for is the Holy Spirit. The Bible says one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is wisdom. He's praying for the Holy Spirit. What's the most important thing we, we could ask for? Holy Spirit. Most of our problems every day are not what you think. Most of our problems are falling into sin and temptation in our thinking and in our actions. And what's the solution? God in you, the hope of glory. Christ in your mind, walking with you. God, the Spirit in you. If we had God's Spirit in us, we'd have more joy. Amen. The fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, goodness, meekness, gentleness, kindness. Karen knows them all. I forget sometimes probably the ones I'm forgetting, the ones I need to work on. <laughs> but we need the fruits of the Spirit. And how many of you want more love, more joy, more peace? Those are the first three. You notice I held up two fingers. I said first three. <laughs> I can't add. So, but that's what we need. The Holy Spirit in our lives. How do you get it? Jesus said, up until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask. And that word ask there in Greek when he says ask, knock, seek, it's an ongoing asking for these things. We should be pleading with the Lord. Jesus said, if you have a son and he's hungry and asks for a loaf of bread, would you give him a rock? If he asks for a fish, would you give him a, a serpent? And Luke adds one more. He says, if he asks for an egg, would you give him a scorpion? Of course not. And then Jesus said, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? Now, in the Lord's Prayer, we pray, give us this day our what? Daily bread. daily bread. Part of that is praying daily for the Spirit of God. That is part of our daily bread as a Christian, that we have God's Spirit, because you can't read the bread of life without the Spirit of God. By the way, one of the principal works of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said when the Spirit comes, He will bring to your remembrance the things that I have said unto you. God's Spirit will remind you of the things I've said. Now, I'm going to take a little detour here and tell you why I think it is so important for us to have the Holy Spirit. It is our greatest need. I'm just going to go through uh, a series of points here. And I hope that you can take a deep breath and pay attention because I want to inspire you where you hunger and thirst after the Holy Spirit so that if God were to say to you, ask whatever you want, you'd say, I want the Holy Spirit. Amen. And you're not going to be praying about that red car and the bank account and all those other things. You'd recognize your greatest need is the Holy Spirit. If Jesus comes and you got a lot of money in the bank and you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're out of luck. If Jesus comes and you got a car full of Italian, a garage full of Italian cars, and you don't have the Holy Spirit, 
not going to save you. What profit is it to you if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? But if you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, if you receive the latter rain, oh, that's what the church needs today, friends. The Holy Spirit needs to be the priority. It is from cover to cover in the Bible, from the place where God says His Spirit moved upon the face of the waters there in Genesis to the last words in the Bible where it says the Spirit and the bride say come. The Holy Spirit is a biblical theme. Christ comes out of the water at His baptism. The Holy Spirit descends. Jesus said, I'm going to the Father that I might send the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts begins in Acts chapter 2. Matter of fact, Jesus says in Acts chapter 1, wait for the promise of the Father most important thing they were to wait for is the filling of the Holy Spirit. How did the people receive the rain in the days of Elijah? They humbled themselves and they prayed and God sent the storm. How did the apostles receive the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2? They put aside their differences. They'd been arguing about which of them was the greatest. And once they stopped doing that and they got on their knees and they prayed together and they studied together, the place was shaken there was a sound of a mighty wind and tongues of fire descended on them and the gospel began to spread. If God's church, it's amazing. Sometimes I meet people at church. It happened a couple weeks ago. Go to the same church. They can't talk to each other. And we're thinking we're going to tell the world about love. And Jesus said, by this all men will know that you're my disciples, by your love for one another. I was talking about this in Romania and a man came up to me and said, so glad you mentioned this. My brother and my father are here and they haven't spoken nine years and they go to the same church. And we wonder why God's not pouring out the Holy Spirit. Christianity 101 is to love your neighbor and you don't find a neighbor much closer than a church member or your family. We're also told to love our enemies. We got to love each other. It's our greatest need. It's a life and death issue. Romans 8, 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. If you live after the flesh, you will die, but if through the Spirit you mortify the deeds of the body, you will live. We need the Holy Spirit to draw us near to God. The Bible says the Holy Spirit draws us. In John 16, verse 8, when He has come, He will convict the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment. It's the Holy Spirit that's going to speak to you when you're surfing through the channels and says, you need to change channels. If you want to be pure in heart, don't keep watching that. You're going to listen to those people use my name in vain. Doesn't that bother you? I know Christians that don't think twice about watching programs where they're using God's name in vain and, uh, or watching adultery and lying and they're saying, I'd never do those things. I just enjoy watching other people do them. <laughs> That's like sinning vicariously. The Holy Spirit's going to tell you when you're getting ready to say those things about somebody else and you know that wouldn't be kind, it would be gossip. Holy Spirit says, uh, let's leave that unsaid and you listen. We need to be guided by the Spirit. Amen? Amen? It's so much easier if you got a church filled with the Holy Spirit. Years ago, Karen and I were in Russia and uh, we were in Stavropol. I heard it mentioned in the news today. And uh, they had buses that ran on electricity through overhead lines, but they had tires. There wasn't a track below. There was an overhead power line and this spring-loaded thing that pushed against the power line. And one of the drivers took a wide turn and he got disconnected. And it was interesting to see everybody got out of the bus and they pushed the bus until they got it back underneath the power lines and he used this pole and he got it back connected to the power and they drove away. But wouldn't it have been terrible if the driver had said, all right, let's all get behind and forget about the electricity. Let's just push the bus. And that's what many churches are doing right now. We're trying to get all the work of the Lord done by pushing the bus. Where if we would just reconnect to the power, we'd take off. You know, Amazing Facts does international evangelism and I'm interested in good methods and machines and programs and sometimes you need more money for what you're doing. But the early church did not even have electricity or email. They didn't have television or radio. They did not have a printing press. The gospel went faster back then than it's going now because they had something that most Christians don't have. They had the Holy Spirit. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in the church. Well, I need to get back to Elijah because um, I see I'm running out of time and I want to make sure and get him back home again. <laughs> so he said, 
ask. And Elijah says, or Elisha says, I want a double portion of your spirit. Elijah says in verse 10, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken away from you, it will be so for you. But if not, it will not be so. So the criteria is Elisha's told by Elijah, if you see me when I'm taken up, you're going to get your prayer. If you don't see it, you won't. Now, if you knew that by keeping your eyes fixed on Elijah, you're going to get a double portion of the Holy Spirit, would you ever take your eyes off him? No. You'd be going around like this all the time, no matter what he does. You'd be watching him like this. <laughs> and when you got ready to blink this eye, you'd hold that one open and you'd blink that one. You, see, you didn't want to miss it. You'd be wanting to watch all the time. You know, the Bible tells us, Christ said, if I am lifted up, that's a position of visibility. I will draw all men. Jesus said to, to Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. And what that means is that serpent was lifted up and Moses said, whoever looks on that bronze serpent would be healed. That dead serpent on the pole, that bronze serpent represented a defeated devil. And when we see Jesus on the cross, it represents a defeated enemy. And it strengthens our faith. And we must keep our eyes on Christ on the cross. And that's what's transformational. That's key to being filled with the Holy Spirit. So it says, he said, all right, that sounds good enough to me. So as they walked on together, I love this. It says, as they continued on and they talked as friends, suddenly, you know, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2, suddenly the place where they were assembled was shaken. Suddenly, it's going to happen. It says, A chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind. It's this vortex, this tornado of light and glory and angels into heaven. Now, I don't think God came galloping down with, you know, horses and old Roman chariots. This is the Old Testament way of talking about God's angels. He calls it chariots and horsemen of fire. God's army, the heavenly host. And uh, there's good theology in that song, Swing Low Sweet Chariot. I looked over Jordan. Remember it says the sons of the prophets were looking over Jordan. And what did I see coming for to carry me home? A band full of angels coming after me. That's what that was. And this chariot of angels scoops up Elijah and as he's going up into heaven, he tells him, hold on. And the angels go, what? We don't do this very often. You want us to hold on? He says, yeah, hold on. And he tosses his mantle down. Elijah sends the mantle down to Elisha. And the Bible tells us that Elisha saw it. What was the criteria for him receiving the Holy Spirit in double portion? He saw it. Did the disciples in Acts chapter 1 see Jesus ascend to heaven? While they looked on and beheld, they saw him ascend into clouds of glory. Two angels came. Men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing into the heavens? They saw it. Were they baptized with the Holy Spirit? Elisha takes up the mantle that had fallen from Elijah. He rends his own clothes. All of our righteousness is like filthy rags. He takes up the mantle of Elijah. It's now his. He was first given it temporarily as justification, and now he owns it as sanctification. He goes back to the Jordan River and he rolls it up like he saw his master do. He imitates his master. We should walk even as Christ walked. Amen? Amen. And he strikes the water. Says, where is the Lord God of Elijah? The waters part. The Bible says that when he crosses over, the sons of the prophets look at Elisha and they say, surely the spirit of Elijah rests upon Elisha. Amen. He received a double portion. Friends, we need the latter rain. Amen? Amen? We need the Spirit of God. Wonderful story I'll close with. True story. During the Civil War, Fort Sumter, better known as Andersonville, was the most dreaded prison of war camp operated by the South. In fact, it started out as 16 acres that they were supposed to hold 10,000 people. Ended up holding 32,000 men. No sanitation, no water. The only water, they had a swamp 
this uh, dirty creek kind of ran through the quarters of the guards and the stables and ran into their camp and that was their drinking water. 16,000 soldiers died from malaria and from disease and fever. There was only one person who was executed following the Civil War for war crimes. That was the warden of Andersonville. It was that bad. They all looked like skeletons when they were finally rescued. Winters, they had no shelter. Freezing there in Georgia. Summertime, 100 degree heat and the humidity. Dying of thirst, no fresh water. And one day when they couldn't take it anymore, one August day, some of the Christians in the group said, we need to pray. They formed a prayer group in the middle of the camp and they prayed like they never prayed and they said, God, send rain. It hadn't rained in weeks. The sky was clear. And suddenly out of a cloudless sky, uh, a little cloud appeared and it kept getting bigger and bigger until finally it turned into a thunderhead. It burst and it rained on everybody. And another miracle took place. Not only did it pour and just, it was a gully washer, they call it, clean the whole camp, assuage the thirst. But then lightning struck in the middle of the camp. One lightning bolt struck in the middle of the camp. All these men, hundreds, were gathered praying for rain and the rain came. And then after the storm ended, the miracle is no one was hit by the lightning. And where the lightning hit, water began to pour out of the ground. And it continued to run and provide fresh water for everybody in the camp until the end of the war, and it is still running today. I think they got a picture of it up on the street. You can go see it. It's called Providence Spring. Came in the answer to prayer. Friends, we need that living water today. Amen? We need to pray that God will do something extraordinary. Do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? Are you wanting to have that refreshing of the Holy Spirit to give you love and peace and joy and victory and know that your sins are under the blood of the Lamb? Would you like to pray for that now as we close? And you who are watching, let's ask him. Our loving Father, this is the most important thing we could ask for. Jesus died to buy the right for us to be filled with his Spirit. Please send it now, Lord. Send it into the hearts and lives of each person who's gathered here and those watching and listening. Forgive us for our sins. We're coming just like we are. Cover us with your robe and fill us with your power. We thank you and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, friends. Now, a couple of important announcements. When is our final meeting? Tomorrow. It's not tomorrow night. We've been meeting every night. We're going to be meeting tomorrow morning right here. We'll begin going on the air. We can't change the time right sharp at 11 o'clock. I hope you'll come a little bit early and uh, we'll get a good seat and pray for the outpouring of the Spirit one of our most important presentations called A Day of Good News. Amen. Hope we see you here. You can still bring your friends. God bless and have a good night.